And this is the presentation on what changes with reusable space flight at scale. So, who am I? My background is in IT. I'm not a rocket scientist. This is not a technical brief. You're not gonna walk away from here thinking this is this many nuts, this many bolts for this sort of engine. That's not what this is about. This is about getting a light, a, a lay of the land, and then building on there and having an understanding of what might be coming on the horizon. Um, I believe there will be an impact, and hence the reason for this presentation. The journey ahead through this presentation. We will touch on the reusable space flight, um, where it's come from, where it is today, um, then we'll look at what we mean by scale. Um, there's really two parts to this question, which is the reusable, reusability and the scale. And then finally, we'll then go into some of the potential impacts. Obviously, it's in the future, so the potential, and that's where I'd ask for a bit of audience participation. If you sub see some things that you think will also be an impact, by all means, um, ask questions, raise your thoughts. So let's begin. In October 12, 1492, a while back. The Santa Maria, that ship there, arrived in the New World. This is the ship that Christopher Columbus um, found the New World. Turning out it wasn't India, it was just the Bahamas, it was a little bit lost. But colonization, this that whole era from then on, really, it's a story of many things, but a story of technology. Without the technology, enough, none of that would have been possible. And where it began with this little ship, things for a long time really were quite static. We'll look at this slide here, this, this graph here. What this graph depicts is the tonnage per sh average ship. So the blue from 1630, so a little bit after the colonization began, through to 1880 when the Industrial Revolution really was kicking off, you see a series of blue dots. That is those are all the wooden ships, your, your era of wood and sailboats. And you'll see that not much really changed. There was a gradual increase in the size and the capabilities of the ships. Obviously there's a lot more of them going across the Atlantic, but really there wasn't much, that much change in terms of technology. And then we reach all those colorful dots on the far right. That is the Industrial Revolution. That's when the tonnage per ship suddenly skyrocketed. And the impact, impacts of that, well, we're still feeling them today. But rather than just having blue dots and dots on a graph, we'll have a look at this. This here is a way to visualize what you're actually looking at. So dots are dots, that's great, but these are ships to scale. Now starting at your top left, you've got a Viking longboat. They actually made it to the Americas. They tried to establish a colony back in the year of that and nothing really came of it. The second ship from the left, that's the Santa Maria. So the first ship Chris and Columbus sailed to, that little one is what reached there. Your third one, that is your standard three deck wooden ship at the end of sort of the era of wooden sails. So that's where sort of wooden ships got to prior to the industrial revolution. The fourth one, that is the SS Great Britain. That is one of the first large scale steamships that began taking passengers across the Atlantic. The one on the right, what you're probably more familiar with, that's the Titanic. One journey, didn't go quite so well. And then at the bottom, you have the super tankers of today. And you look at all the cargo on there, the 40, 40 foot shipping containers, just one of them could probably fit in the Santa Maria, and depending on what you're taking, would quite, quite possibly overload in a second. So the scale difference is what we're really getting at here between the Santa Maria, that slow initial gradual increase to where we are today, you can see it on the screen, it's quite enormous. So we take a bit of a tangent here. Um, air travel. I mean, what we get is why rocket, where um, rockets have really been inefficient. So you've all done air travel, or you know of air travel. You turn up to the airport, you hop on your aircraft, you fly to your destination, and then you leave and then they go in the plane. And then like, for your return journey, you rock up to the airport, hop on your plane, go to your destination, and then they go in the plane. Except that doesn't happen. Obviously, they build the plane, 
and then you keep using it because it's far more economical to not burn your plane every time you take a trip. That's been the downside to space flight. Obviously, since we've gone to space, everyone's had those ideas, you've seen pictures of space stations, you've seen pictures of colonies, all those big ideas, but the bottleneck has always been, every time the rocket goes up, it gets used once and it's done. So if we could reuse rockets the way we use aircraft, things could be much cheaper, potentially. So obviously there's a bit of a broad idea of why space flight should be, could be reused. But firstly, why not? Why hasn't it been possible? Um, really it's been cost and complexity. The, obviously the complexity of sending a rocket up into space and having it land as a, and trying to reuse that as a level of complexity on top of the existing problem. And the big one is that to land, it means you need to design your rockets with a lot of inefficiencies, um, a lot of wasted capacity. Obviously with a rocket, you can be as efficient as you need to be to get your thing into space and then you don't care. It just burns up. But if you re need to reuse it, you need to design a lot of extra engineering that doesn't is wasted space. It's not there for cargo, it's not there for payload, and it basically doesn't make money. Ultimately, it doesn't make money to make that ship reusable. Um, there's also been a lack of incentive. Most, like a lot of your sort of space flight at the moment has been either government stuff, like your defense, or like commercial with large scale satellites. But there've only been one or two here. So if you're only launching a rocket once every two or three years for whatever you need, there really is no need to be reusable. If it launches, the, the difference between the two really doesn't change much. So it's, there's no real big incentive to do that. Um, but then why would you? As we mentioned, obviously, if you don't have to rebuild your aircraft entire, every time you fly, it should be much cheaper. All you need to do is get your, like a 747 today, get your engineers to have once over, refuel it, put your passengers, and away you go. That also means you don't have to test it. Because when you need it built a new spaceship each time, you need to test it, you need to make sure it's good, you need to do all those testings, engineering, to make sure it actually works. And you get one shot because you don't get to get that rocket again. So now we'll move into how would you do it if you were to. There's really two sort of questions to answer. Firstly is fully versus partial reusability. That's, do you set, get everything back that you send up? Or do you only take a part of what you send up get back? The second question is the design. Is the space plane versus rocket? I mean, space plane might not be the technical term, but it is what they are. It's the aircraft that flies back to it. So now we're gonna have a look at the existing field of what is out there. So, firstly, the space planes. These, obviously the most iconic, the space shuttle. Um, 135 launches, most of them, Successful, unfortunately the two accidents weren't. This was the great success of reusability. The space shuttle goes up, it does the things, it comes back down, you test it out, you fix it, re refuel it, put your new payload on and you can do it again. But it was also a failure. And it was a failure because of cost. With all the other parts of the rocket, like the orange bit wasn't reused, the side boosters could get a couple of reuses, um, but also because it was basically a government project with a lot of that bureaucratic oversight. It just never was a financial um, viable success compared to an expendable rocket. It, it was far cheaper just to use an expendable rocket and get it up there and not have to worry about it. Which is why eventually, on top of other things, the space shuttle was, was tired. It just never really, the reality never met the dream of reusability being a cost effective and practical thing. Um, the one on the right, for comparison's sake, that is the Burang. You can never heard of it. That was the Soviet Union's um, uh, competitor. They were actually building it and prototyping it. It actually made one flight into orbit before the Cold War ended. The Soviet Union collapsed, and that ended up in a shed, basically deteriorating. So it never got anywhere. One of those what could have been if the Soviet Union had continued. In terms of space plans, where there has been success more recently is in these. These are your unmanned, essentially drones, an unmanned aircraft. The X-37, the image you see on the left, 
There's about a half a dozen, and they've been launching for the last decade. You probably haven't really heard of them. These have been mostly using US Air Force missions, so they're a lot of classified stuff. Um, that's been where there has been some success. They're actually a lot smaller, and because you don't need to take a human into space, you can get away with cutting away a lot of um, excess um, design. It's a unmanned drone, flies it back in, you don't have to worry about things. So that's the X-37. And there's been now a couple of rivals become, um, becoming available. So in the middle there, that's the Indian one, and on the far right is the, the, the new Chinese prototype. So the Shenlong, which is the Chinese one, they've had a few successful flights, and the RLD-TD, which is the Indian one, which is currently in production and may or may, or may um, fly in the near future. So this has been where more recently the space plane design has sort of had some success. And lastly, in terms of these space planes, we'll touch on Virgin Galactic's um, spaceship one. This is Richard Branson's toy, if you saw him in the um, news of probably a year or two ago. It's not, it doesn't go on board. It flies at really high, you get a few minutes of weightlessness, and that's it. So it's more of a, it's a, it, it's a prototype and may lead to a larger capabilities, but this, this just rounds out the pit. Well, why have these been less successful? Well, because, of the, as I mentioned, the design restraints. Needing to have a wing, a, a glide capability, all these other things you need to do to make it a plane, mean that every time you launch, that's dragging all that up into space. That weight and drag and all those extra complexities make them more expensive and less viable compared to a rocket. So they've had mixed success, but they haven't really been the future that people thought they would be. So that's one half of your reusability. The other half now is the lockers. And really the field is SpaceX with their Falcon 9s. Um, they, this began as a partnership with NASA. So NASA had a contract they put out to some of the commercial um, um, world to say to see who could actually actually build a rocket. Um, if you're not aware, this is owned by Elon Musk. He's, he has a real desire to make life multiplanetary, and make, in order to do that, make reuse a, a space flight cheap. And for a space flight to be cheap, it needs to be reusable. Like your plane, it needs to be checked over, refueled, and good to go. That's the heart of what he's trying to do. That's why this exists, and that's where we are now. That reusability to be cheap, so that we have low cost space flight. Since 2016, there's been 167 launches, so more than the space shuttle. This year, there's been 32. So 32 times they've sent their rocket in space and had it land. Of those launch, of those actual launches, three of them have actually made 13 consecutive launches. So this is just giving an idea of what's going on there. Um, the reason they launch so often, and this just comes down to that incentive, is Starlink. Uh, if you haven't heard of Starlink, it's a new satellite-based internet capability, but it's going to be at much lower um, orbit. Most satellites are traditionally very high up, but that means it's slower to connect. Starlink is very close to the Earth, so you have very quick speeds, but that means you see less of the Earth, so then you need more of them. He's talking about 40,000 satellites, so that's a lot. So now you've got incentive to make multiple launches. So this has really been the heart of why SpaceX has been launching so often. Um, they're made using reused rockets normal. Before SpaceX, before the Falcon 9, there really was no viable reusable uh, rocket. Um, it was an idea that was thought to be, to some degree, probably impossible. This has really changed the field and made everything, when everyone else is, everyone else saw a World Cup and go, okay, this is what we want to do. But there's some things to note about this one. Firstly, it is partially reusable. So we look at the images there on the right. The one in the middle, that's the full rocket, but the image on the left, that's the first stage. Only the first stage is reusable. So the full rocket launches, your payload goes up into space, the second stage gets expended, only the first stage returns. 
Um, you can see there the little legs that come out, and I'll show you a video very um, in, in the next slide to show you what it looks like. But that's the falcon knot. It first makes lands. They've actually stopped cleaning them, so they're actually quite um, dirty if you get to see them on TV. In the middle, the two general payloads they've had, which is the one with the large white top, that's just a payload. So they often launch with 40 to 50 satellites per launch, and then they scatter out and take up water. So you talk 50 launches, 50 satellites per launch. With 32, most of them being Starlink, you start to see there are now hundreds if not thousands of satellites up there with the Starlink network. On the right image, just to round out the field, is your Falcon Heavy. It's basically three Falcon 9s strapped together for much heavier loads. So you need heavier loads, or if you know, need to throw a satellite much deeper into space, that's your option. So they're a commercial company, Whoever wants to launch, they tell, they say what they want to what, what they want to launch and where. They figure it out. Okay, you need this rocket or that rocket. There's only been three flights of the super heavy, so not as much have been needed of this. For those who haven't seen the SpaceX uh, the rockets, I'll now um, play two quick clips to give you an understanding of what it actually looks like. This is in fact how most of their satellite um, returns have actually done, on water. Um, I'll just pause there for a sec. That barge is one of two remote barges. So instead of having their rockets return to land, which doesn't really work all the time, the majority of their rockets have actually done this. And in terms of the engineering, this is a 70 meter rocket that has returned from space that lands on an unmanned boat barge in the middle of the ocean. They've done that roughly 30, over 30 times this year. The majority of, them, of the 167 have been there. So it gives you a bit of an understanding of the feats of engineering that are required to actually make this work. So that's SpaceX, they are basically, when it comes to reusable rocketry, they are it, they are the field, in terms of what's actually out there today. Um, we'll now touch base on a few of the other competitors that are starting to arise, just so you have an understanding of the field. So the idea of scale is starting to sort of, I'm building that, that baseline of what scale is. Um, with SpaceX, though, we have these, the modules. We might as well talk about them. Um, these modules, your Crew Dragon, your Cargo Dragon, these are the modules that actually get stuff typically to the International Space Station. Um, in terms of reusability, this is the other thing that SpaceX has at the moment that is reusable. Um, typically, in the past, when astronauts went up to the International Space Station, unless they were on the Space Shuttle, the craft they used were expended. They were used once, 
and then once they, once they came back through the atmosphere, they would be expected. Um, the one on the left, that's the crew one, you see the windows. The one on the right, no windows, a cargo. At the moment, this is the only way the Americans actually have to get to the International Space Station with their own rockets. The only other way America can get to the International Space Station is with the Soyuz, the Russian rock, um, rocket. So given the, obviously the issues with Ukraine, you can see that without this, America would have no ability to go to the International Space, International Space Station without Russia, which could be very bad for them. Um, if you were following it last year, it was on one of these that the Inspiration4, which was the first civilian-only space crew, um, went up last year and then did a couple of orbit, orbits of planet Earth. So there's a Netflix documentary if, you, if you're keen, but that's what happened last year. So you, you saw that on the media. This is the capsule that they went up with it. The only difference they made is they removed the, um, the top where you actually connect to the International, International Space Station, put in a large, glass dome so they had a really nice view of under it. So with the other competitors that are out there in terms of the rocketry, um, the big one really at the moment is Blue Origin. Um, this is owned by G um, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, so the second richest person on the planet, who is behind Elon Musk, the richest person on the planet. Weird tangent, but the two richest people on the planet now have their own space companies. Or not the and then there's Richard Branson with his own little rocket. So it seems to be the thing when you're all the multi-billionaires, you become you, you start space is coming. Um, in terms of what they've got, firstly is the new ship. Um, that's the one you see on the left. This is the one you, want to, you may have seen last year on the news. So it goes up, it doesn't it doesn't go into orbit. It goes up, you have a few minutes of weightlessness, and then the pod comes back down again. A bit like Richard Branson's one as well. So it both parts are reusable. The big thing with them though is to they, what they're doing is, that's the first stepping stone. What they're actually looking to create is the Blue Origin, which if you look in the other images, you've got the Blue Origin three in the middle, each with their loads, and then you've got SpaceX's Falcon 9 on the far right. I'll put that there just to give a scale of what they're doing. They're looking to make a rocket that's far larger than what SpaceX is doing. Um, quite a substantial much. Okay. It's in development. It's the one I would say is most likely to actually come to fruition soon, but in terms of what's out there, this is probably the next best competitor to SpaceX. In terms of rockets with Europe and China and Japan and the rest of the world, everyone else is taking notch. In the past, there really wasn't much interest in reuse built in, and when um, the SpaceX was starting up, there was basically a lot of a lot of those in the old space that were saying essentially it's not going to work, it won't happen. But now that it is, everyone's sort of taking note and beginning to make the run. So, ESA, the European Space Agency, under uh, Ariane Group, they have now begun research and development into a reusable um, um, rocket. Um, the Chinese have their Long March series, which is their existing rocket. They are now looking at a reusable space um, rocket. They've also taken a approach similar to America where they contract it to the commercial world to come up with um, ideas. And that was really the great success of NASA that instead of making their own rockets, they had industry come up with their own ideas, they had that competitiveness, and that's why SpaceX is, because they won that competition. Well, China's taking a similar approach in terms of allowing that competition to occur. So there's lots of um, companies now all beginning to start up to have that research and develop these sort of capabilities. It's early days though, so it's probably be a little while before they produce anything that actually flies properly. But they will be very, um, they will be quite close behind the Americans in terms of reuse building, even their industrial scale. Uh, the Japanese actually have quite a solid rocket um, industry, and they have now also directed that all their, um, all those that actually work in the space era are to develop a SpaceX style rocket. That was their words. So everyone's seen what SpaceX can do and everyone wants a bit of that. Uh, and I've put in others, in others. If you look on the screen, the black rocket on the right, that's the Electron. That is a New Zealand company making small scale satellites for small loads that is designed to be um, partially reusable. Their design is that it parachutes back through, back through the atmosphere, you'll catch it by a helicopter and make it reusable. Hasn't quite worked yet. They've managed to catch it once, but 
I put that there to sort of show that it's other countries, but other companies are really sort of seeing that reusability is a industry worth going into. And there's a lot of startups, a lot of money now going into this space to sort of follow the, the SpaceX bandwagon. What kind of things are they trying to launch into space? Um, the electrons are your micro satellites. So very small, their idea of, the idea there is to be cheap by being small. So your little tube satellites, if you've heard the term tube satellites, um, obviously with technology getting smaller, like your iPhones now can do what a building size computer did in the past, you can now fit a lot of electronics and all the other gadgetry into a very small satellites. So you don't need to send up a giant satellite uh, rocket if all you need is a few little um, satellites here and there. So, and everyone sort of, I think a lot of companies sort of recognise that competing with SpaceX really isn't really viable because you're also competing against the old experimental rockets. So the old experimental rockets, rockets are still doing their thing for your large scale things. Then there's SpaceX, so reusable, the only real sort of area that most of your reusable space can see as viable is your small scale tube satellites. And that's why a lot of them are smaller scale. Answer your question. By all means, ask questions as we go. Okay. So what's missing? You saw the answer. But we're, so we've seen the reusable space line. Yep. You know about SpaceX, it's been in the news the last few years. I've shown you what's coming as yes, competitors. Great. But what we're missing is scale. This is not a talk about the viability of reusable space flight. Space flight. This is a talk about what impact is when reusable space flight becomes scale. Which brings us to Starship and Super Heavy. This is the next iteration of what SpaceX is developing. Um, there are three components to it. If you look on the images, the first is Starship. This is the bit that will go into space and fly around with humans, with satellites, and deliver payloads into orbit. So that's Starship. The middle one, that's your super heavy booster. So when we go back to your Falcon 9, when I said the first stage is the only bit that gets reused, that's the bit you saw in the video that went up and came back down and landed on the barge. That middle one is going to do that, but on a much greater scale. Um, you can see on the final image on the right there, that is the super heavy booster with the Starship stacked on their launch. And if you look at the bottom, you can see a number of cars and utes. To give understanding just how big this is. Um, the Saturn V, which took humans to the moon, this is larger than that. Um, crazily enough, in order to actually make this as cheap as possible, they've done two things differently. Firstly, there's no, car there's no carbon fiber or anything else really exotic. This is made out of steel. Just plain old, well not plain old steel, but it is, this is a steel um, ship. They want to be as cheap as possible. The other one, as you may have noticed, is that tower. When you saw that video of Falcon 9 landing, it had legs. It landed, legs folded out, great. But that's weight. Like with your space plane, that is weight that needs to be dragged up to space, dragged back down again, it's a waste. So they've decided to delete the legs. But how do you land a rocket without legs? Well, you use what they call the chopsticks on the right, the tower. The idea is that you will fly up in space, launch, and then that tower will catch the rocket when it comes back down. Like literally a pair of chopsticks, it will fly down, hover, that tower will then grab the rocket and land it. It's probably the sort of thing that would be a good idea as when kids are playing in the backyard that you, but you wouldn't really take seriously. But there we are, they're making it. It's built, they're testing at the moment, and the next few probably weeks to months, probably the next few months, they'll do their first launch. So that's where SpaceX is going. So it's designed for full reusability versus partial. What does that mean? It means that both Starship and the Super Heavy Booster will be reusable. So the Starship, you can see it's black, it has the heat tiles like a um, space shuttle. So like the space shuttle, where it flew back through, spaceship, um, Starship will do that. It won't fly as well because it's more rocket shaped, but it will still be reusable. Rapid reusability. The goal here is a one hour turnaround time. Whether they get that or not, who knows? But rapid means that like an airliner, they all have the mechanics, have it given a once over, refuel it, 
put it back on the pad, put your payload on, and away you go. In the gig understanding, it, is, it takes roughly six minutes for the booster to launch into space, deliver its payload, and land back down on the pad. Six minutes, so we're not taking an airline across the world. Space, it turns out, is actually not that far away. It's just very hard to get because it's all the way up. But the booster will have a flight time of approximately six minutes from launch to recovery. Oh, sorry, what I was going to ask, are they solid fuel or are they liquid? Liquid. Okay. We'll touch on the fuels a bit because there is one of the impacts. Um, but yes, it is a liquid fuel, not a solid fuel. The goal is three launches per day for each of the boosters. The Starship has approximately 100 tonnes, so quite a large payload. Uh, and more as a point of interest, the Artemis program, which is NASA's plan to go back to the moon, um, they have contracted with SpaceX to use the Starship as that platform. So this is what, if the moon landing actually happens in the next few years, we'll be able to get to something. So NASA is relying, relying on this to be the way to get to the moon. Okay, that's just one rocket. We've seen this before with Falcon 9, we've seen this with the other, the other competitors, we've seen this with the Space Shuttle. It's one or two ships that go up in the air. Again, what are we missing? We're missing scale. The plan is to make one booster per month, three, a Starship in three days, and Elon Musk has a desire for a thousand starships to support a colony on the moon. His idea is that we have a colony on the moon and to sustain it, you need a thousand starships. Those are all just random numbers, doesn't really, but that's the goal. Um, if you look at the imaging, first you see the, the naval launch. So the idea is that they'll, obviously a lot of launches becomes a problem for land. So they've built, no, they've purchased two old oil rigs, offshore oil rigs, that are being remade as launches. And so the majority of those launches will take place off shore. <coughs> so the way you saw that video where the rocket landed at sea, they'll also take off at sea. So there's less impact on this. But you look at those numbers, there's a lot of spaceships to be made. And Starbase, if you look on the right, that's their current facility. Um, you can see all the car parks, it's quite a large facility, a half a dozen large tents. The tower in the middle where they, they build their new rockets. So that's the current facility. But that's not really what you need to do scale. What we really need to do scale is a factory. Something like that. Um, if you're not aware, Elon Musk, as well as only SpaceX, also owns Tesla. And Tesla, obviously the makers of all the Tesla EV, um, electrical vehicles you see around, their great success isn't that they are the best or the only electrical vehicle. Their success has been about making machines that make machines. Their success has been because they make their factories more efficient than their rivals. And it's the ability to make efficient factories, not just technology pieces, that's really made what Tesla is why Tesla is successful. They are bringing that to rocket construction. So this here is a photo that was taken earlier this month. This is the new Star Factory in Florida that they are um, building. 12 months ago, it was basically a paddock. That's where it's today. So this is what I'm starting to talk about scale. This is a factory that will make Starships and super heavy boosters in the same way you produce cars in mass production lots. So that's big, but what is the impact or the size? So this here is a graph that really sort of um, shows you what we're talking about in terms of scale. Um, this is mass to orbit. On your left, 15 to 16,000 tons, that is all the mass that human beings have ever launched into space. The Americans, the Russians, the Soviets, China, Europe, anything, everything that's ever gone into space is that far there, approximately 16,000 tons. The Starship, one of them launching three times per week is that there, the second bar. One Starship launching three times a week in one year will launch as much payload into orbit as all of human history. The third bar is what one Starship 
launching their ideal three times per day, which is the goal, will launch in one year. 110,000 tonnes. So you can already see with one Starship in one year, we'll launch several times the mass in orbit that humans have ever launched into space. And then the large blue one on the right, that is what 10 Starships launching three times a day will launch in one year. What would the carbon footprint be of something like that? In the impacts, okay. that's a big thing. Because remember, this is a factory. <coughs> How many boosters do they, want to, do they want to make a month? One. Let's say there's a bit of you know, delays here and there, so we'll say 10 per year. That, those 10 starships on that is one year's production. In your second year production, you now have 20. So that doubles on your second year operation. Third year, you now have got triple that. Let's round, it's at 1 million, 100,000, let's round it down to a million tons into orbit. But each year, the staff actually looks to be adding roughly a million tons into orbit. In five years, these graph, these parts here won't even appear on this graph. There'll be a few pixels that you can barely even see. That's if everything goes according to plan. So, will they make three times per day? Maybe. Will they make 10 per year? Maybe. But even if it's a fraction of that, what they'll be launching into space will be on a scale we have never had before. And this is the, this is the slide that really shows what we talk about scale. This is the difference between a few sailing ships and everything else. That's the difference. No, because it's never happened before. We've never had to think of the implications. So, to this slide again, you've got the Santa Maria. Christopher Columbus's boat that bopped into America back way in the day. Then you've got that there. The sort of the largest of your wooden sailing ships at the end of the era of sail, before the Industrial Revolution. So where we are today is really probably similar to that. We have got rocket reuse, we've got expendable rockets that we know how to make. We have got the reusable ones that we have, the Falcon 9s, that are sort of doing what we've done at a much grander scale. With the new um, Starships, we're looking at this sort of scale. And now you start to have a look in your own minds what that impact has. When you've gone from that to that, moving goods, moving stuff around the world. Just look at the world today, compare it to what it was four or five hundred years ago. So the question there is, will there be impacts? Yes, there's going to be impacts. So this next bit is the third bit, where we'll actually look through some of these impacts that <laughs> potentially may come to fruition. And if you've got your own questions, by all means, this is the part where, please ask questions. So unfortunately, no, because basically they're still in production, um, development. So until they're actually used, we're not going to really know the difference. And that's that's the again one of the question marks. So we're not sure how. But what we do know is that all the effort has gone into making them cheaper. So they've been made with steel. They've deleted the legs. They're making the factory. So everything becomes cheaper to mass produce. Um, really, the only cost going forward is the cost of the mechanics to check, check, check them over and the cost of the fuel to refuel them. So fuel will cost, yeah. but you're deleting the cost of an entire ship each time. So like that original um, image of the airline that we burnt down every time we took a flight, imagine the difference between having to burn your aircraft every time you took a flight and not. It's, the actual data will sort of present itself when it presents itself. So it's unfortunate we don't know, and they've got projections. How about SpaceX? Uh, substantially yes, but to be fair, their real benefit has been that Starlink. So they are cheaper than anyone else, um, but because SpaceX needs their own rockets to launch Starship, the majority of their reusability has come through the fact they have their own need to 
launches. So the vast majority have been in-house launches where they just deduct it from themselves and they pay for it when you buy your Starlink terminal and you connect to their internet. But they are not that much different from your, um, your expendable ones, which is why your expendable rocket industry is still, still viable, still remains. The difference is not on a large scale. So a million tons of stuff into space, can anyone launch anything into space or is there an international agreement? No. Um, we'll touch on that, but yes, that's, that is some of the considerations. Um, at the moment, there is only one player, that's SpaceX. But everyone else can see the same graphs that we can see. So it's, it's, a, it's an industry in bandwagon that obviously everyone will want to be on. Um, but at the moment, it's SpaceX and it's broadly America. Um, so firstly, we'll touch on technology in terms of impact. So obviously, the first thing is infrastructure. When you're launching a million tons into orbit, even a fraction of that into orbit every year, you can now do a lot of things you never thought you could do. On a much larger scale, on a greater, with much greater capability and a much lower cost. Just the fact that you can mass produce these things, obviously substantially lower, how much is to be seen. A lot of those sort of dictate, dictate where they launch from, the regulations. But uh, as you look at the field, there is there isn't a million tons of stuff to throw into orbit. So it's a it's that supply and demand. They're about to produce the supply, but there is not a million tons of demand because we never had a reason to send a million tons up there. So it's it's an empty field that will be filled with something, which is where these impacts come in. But also, why we don't know the question mark is it'll exist, but we don't have. Um, so four of the key areas I'll touch base on in terms of technology, which I think will be sort of the dominant, which is the ones that already exist, are your satellites, your probes, your landers, and your stations. So your satellites and probes, here we're sort of differentiating with satellites being those that sort of just orbit the Earth and probes that go out in space, just for this uh, presentation. Um, the differences you're likely to see here, the mega constellations will probably become more numerous. So Starlink, as I mentioned earlier, is looking to have anywhere up to 40,000 satellites. Oh, everyone can see that that's actually quite a, seems to be a viable um, path. So Amazon, again, the other competitor to SpaceX, they've announced they will, are gonna try and make a mega constellation. Um, China has a Guwei Li pronunciation. They have their own um, intent now to make a mega constellation. And there may be other competitors. So, the amount, the, the total number of sort of satellites in space is going to be quite um, a great deal bigger. On the other side of the scale, this is lots of little tiny satellites, is your heavyweight satellites. So when you can launch 100 tonnes several times per day, you can have far larger satellites. So I think your Hubble Space Telescope, think your, your large scale stuff, you can now have much larger satellites and probes in space. So if you want to go out to the um, solar system, that becomes much more viable. Um, we talk here with fast transit times. Previous satellites have, sort of have, have been so small because they, that's what we can get up there. So they don't have a large fuel supply, they can't take much scientific research equipment, they're very limited. Now you'll be able to have a lot more sp um, fuel, a lot more capability, you'll be able to throw it much further. Your stations, that there on the right is your International Space Station. You'll notice all the pods that humans inhabit. They're all the size they are because that's all that humans can get into space. They, they are the diameter of what a rocket in the past could get up. With this new capability, you'll likely see stations on a far grander scale, just because you can do it. We haven't been able to do anything bigger. Now you can, it's just a matter of money to get it up there. Uh, in orbit construction though, well, I imagine will be one of the largest changes. In the past, you had each of the pods go up, they connect together, and that's it, that's your station. Whereas the International Space Station, the Mir before that, um, all those sort of ones, you'll have an ability to construct in space. But it's a thing we've never done before. How do you do that when we've never had to build anything up there um, in the past? But what will it be? Well, it'll be accommodation, workspaces, and the big one I'll touch on a few times is tourism. There's only so much demand for government stuff, there's only so much demand for scientific stuff. Eventually, it's going to be demand from tourism that I believe will have the largest impact on space. 
your landers. Um, as just briefly, Artemis, um, if you look on the image on the right, those three landers, these are the things that land on the moon, land on Mars, etc. Those are the three rivals that um, NASA had as competitors for the Artemis program. The Starship on the left, SpaceX is one, is what they chose. You look at the other two, they are basically just what the old Eagle was when we did the Apollo missions, just on a slightly larger scale. These, the new scale, what we can do means we can land far greater quantities of stuff, people, etc., um, on the moon. Um, again, SpaceX has a contract to do it by 20, 2024. Whether they make that, who knows, but the landers is something that becomes far more viable when you can actually launch a lot of stuff up there. If it goes into your workforce, I mean, we can't do anything up there unless you've got something to build it up there. Um, so, first, you humans which will really divide more and more, I believe, into your professionals and your tourists. Professionals, what we've always had, we've had our space, our astronauts, we've had our science, scientists, our engineers, the people trained by NASA and all the other um, agencies around the world that go up and do their scientific stuff. That's been the norm for pretty much all of space flight history. Tourism, on the other hand, is the new one. It's the inspiration for from last year that went up. It's the crews that are now paying to go up that in the past, there was no ability to go up there because the capability simply didn't exist. You had to be in the government and have billions of dollars to actually go anywhere. That bottleneck no longer exists. But we also touched base in terms of machines. With all the advances in artificial technology, in your electrical vehicles, your battery storage that you see with some Teslas and all your EVs and all the other sort of things here on Earth, your iPhones, that technology translates very well into space. So on the left, you've got an electrical truck. When you're in space, the ability to recharge now just means a battery and a solar panel. You don't need to take as much fuel up there. You don't need to worry about all those other things in the past you may have needed to. You just need an efficient, efficient battery and a solar panel. In the middle is a Boston Dynamics robot, capable, um, one of the ones you can get now. So not everything's going to be humanoid. It's going to be, the, I imagine, those sort of Devices that can go into tight spaces and can be set up there, they're expendable, they can build your things, they can, you can connect everything together without any humans being at risk. And just for more awareness sake, the image on the right, that's Tesla's concept of a robot. So Elon Musk obviously owns Tesla and SpaceX. They are looking to get the artificial intelligence and your self-drive capability of Tesla and put it into a humanoid robot. Walk around your home and or your factory doing humanoid stuff. This is something will, if they can get it to work, will translate very well into space. So you can have a humanoid sized machine that doesn't need to eat, that doesn't need to sleep, that if it gets destroyed, no one cries over. And it can do it on a scale that we, where a human would need to, if they can build the things that humans need to build, they can live in the spaces humans need to inhabit without that threat of human being at uh, risk. So it's just something to watch. But beyond the technology, we now look at science. The depth and breadth of what you can do is going to increase. Uh, we've always had scientific research in space. The ability to do that much grander scale really changes. Um, the image on the right, that's from the Chinese probe that landed on the moon. They've actually grown some small seeds, so sort of agriculture on the moon has been done. But they were obviously limited by what you could see. When you've got a tiny probe all the way up the moon, you can only grow so much, you can only do so much. That gets much greater. A big one, I believe, will be education. In the past, it's been your universities or your big sci um, sci um, scientific research institutes are the only ones who can really get in the space of doing anything. When space flight becomes cheaper, your ability for basically any university, you know, any um, high school, you can actually start setting things up. So, it's going to be much more viable for your high school end of year class to send a probe into space or have it have a little buggy bob, um, bobble about on the moon. Those are the sort of things that will now be viable given the cost that will come down. We touch base on the economy, so supply and demand. So these are sort of, again the impacts we're looking at. The big thing is the bottleneck being removed. Like we've always, there's always been a dream of doing things in space. Again, your, state, your space stations, your colonies, all those sort of scientific stuff, 
you see them in movies. We've never been able to do it because the bottleneck of actually getting this phase has always been there. This, the change here is really that scale means that bottleneck is removed. And so it becomes a question of when that bottleneck is removed, now what? What do, what can we do, what do what we want to do? So will it just be the same but bigger? You know, like the technology we touched on really is what we've always been doing, but just on a larger scale, which will probably most likely be a thing. But uh, again, I want to touch base on tourism and the numbers here. So in 2019, 1.5 billion people took an international flight. 4.5 billion people took a flight of some description, domestic or international. Those are the numbers, numbers of people who were willing to step into a metal aircraft, a tube that flies through the air in a very dangerous place that humans aren't supposed to be because it's cheap enough and safe enough to do. These are the sort of numbers that you would quite possibly look at going into space if it is cheap enough and safe enough to do. When space flight is a six minute ride away, when it's cheap and safe, who would want to spend a week or two in space? Those sort of numbers. Protest noted. Talking about international travel, you pointed out here, one half billion people who are not going on an airplane, they're going somewhere. Right, you're pointing that out in the course of the show. Exactly. But where to go? much better analysis of this is how many people want to go to the air bar? Okay, so to get there, there's bars and there's there. People can go, universities, students, but how many actually go? That's actually a good analogy. Like how many people want to go to Antarctica versus can actually get there? Because Antarctica is very costly and very complex and, and difficult to get to. And is it compatible with you? If Antarctica was something you could easily take a ride to and turn up to a resort with spot, hot spas and springs and a golf course, the numbers that would be in Antarctica would probably be a lot, 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 lot greater. But which is where I talk about the where to. It's, yes, these numbers are those who would love to go, but they've got nowhere to go to. And then there's nowhere in Antarctica to go to it's hard, it's, it's complex. So there's desire, but this is the supply and demand. Um, your ability to go into space is now removed, but you now need something there to go to. Is there any idea though, what's the minimum cost just based on the fuel usage going to be? Uh, like no. Maybe 100,000 days? Oh, I've seen estimates, because that's not the calculation from the old rocket to the Falcon. Yeah. Those ones are known. The Starship that estimated it, like the guessing really, but I looked up and the Saturn was 6,400 per kilo. The Falcon is about 1,600 to 3,000. The Starship they're estimating is 200 per kilo. So under 20 grand for me to go to space with my weight, which is the same price to go to Antarctica. So yeah, it's about 200 per kilo, so about yeah, 20 grand to go to Antarctica. So it becomes viable for basically anyone who's a millionaire above at least to go there quite easily. Um, and that's where, that's the challenge. From a few grand to a few hundred dollars per kilo to get into space. Good numbers. So is this not in danger of just becoming multiple mobile spaces where all of the same experience is experienced in the environment? Quite likely. It's demand, that's why why are we talking about tourism? It's the, as I like, we've had, it's always scientific research, it's always been that big, high-minded, let's explore the universe. But now we're moving into a space where it's more exploitation. It's your McDonald's in space, it's your hotels, it's, it's that's, that's, that's where the demand, I believe, will be. Whether we like it or not, that's the demand. Whether we allow it, where regulation comes into it, this is why I've talked about the impacts. This is what we want to happen. It's just technology and regulation that will stop it or allow it. The moral for this that the idea of this is that this will fund the next step, or is it? It's never gone in that direction. Uh, Elon Musk's <coughs> desire is the colony on, on Mars. So, with SpaceX, everything is going towards that. So, all of this is basically built on his dream of putting colony on Mars and having enough sustainment for that. So, that's the goal of everything. <coughs> Everything else is basically not their concern. They know, I mean, they, they do understand what, what's capable of, but this is where I talk about the question mark of impacts is their focus on reducing this capability to do one thing, large scale human habitation in Mars. But when you have a million tons going to orbit every year, 
potentially multiple millions of tons. There's a lot more you can do than just go to Mars. SpaceX isn't really worried about that. Who is? Hence the question mark, and hence the why the stock exists. A lot of other things, a lot of other areas, a lot of other people, a lot of companies, countries that weren't thinking of this suddenly now will have an empty field to do whatever they like. So, so far, as long as you have the money and the technology, which the money no longer is much of a problem. The technology, well, it is what it is, but we've had, it, we've had the International Space Station building and researching that technology. So a lot of technology is sorted. It's now just a, case of, like, a matter of putting money and going. So, but these are the questions I'm asking, so this is what potentially is on the horizon. So as I said, do we have resorts in space? Do we have cruise ships in space? Because that's where the money will be. Whether we want that or not. Hoping, but it's fine money. There's lots of people who want to follow that. Um, but in terms of supply, I mean, as we've sort of touched base, boom and bust. Like any new industry, any new area, there's going to be a lot of big pie in the sky ideas and a lot of them will fail. So, like with aircraft flight, a lot of the companies that initially did air flight are no longer around. The Wright brothers, they had a company that was solely and had a monopoly on aircraft flight for the first few years of human flight. They eventually did the younger got they bought out and they no, no longer a company. Now it's the Boeings and the Airbus that do the human um, normal flight. So there's gonna be boom and bust. And again, all this idea of tourism and all that, I mean, this will come and go, companies will go bust, but some will also make it work. It's gonna be that ecosystem again. But obviously, on land at least, it's the infrastructure. How do you launch it? Where do you store it? You need a port, you need storage. This is one of the impacts they'll have. We'll, not everything can go from via sea. And I put it, Australia as a question mark. I mean, it, we've got a lot of relatively empty space. It may well be an opportunity for Australia to sort of get in on the, at the early days of this and say, hey, we can also launch. But you're launching the largest rockets ever made several times per day, that's gonna have impact. Would that pass a environmental assessment? Maybe, maybe not, but that's, the question mark, the opportunities and potential impacts. Um, in terms of supply, I'll touch base on your vertical integration. Um, what does that mean? That means that at the moment, the reason that SpaceX is so successful is that everything they do is basically done by SpaceX. They haven't needed to contract out to a whole bunch of other companies the way a lot of other industries have. So the winners initially is going to be anything related to basically SpaceX or Elon Musk. So Tesla, Hence the robot will likely get integrated very quickly because he owns both. It's very easy to go, this technology on this rocket, go. So anything related around that or associated will likely be um, one of the successes, the booms. Um, outside of that, it'll be a bit missed bag, booms and busts. So you're seeking out companies. Anyone who can sort of integrate themselves with the existing programs or who can make use of that capacity and take advantage of it, that's where your successes are likely to come from. But as the question before, the gatekeepers. What are your gatekeepers? These, these are the gates that'll stop people, um, companies, countries, individuals from actually using this and stuff. So obviously the first one is SpaceX. You need a contract, it's a private company. SpaceX has their own interests. They're not just gonna launch stuff for the sake of launching stuff, it needs to be viable. Your second gatekeeper is, obviously this is American technology. They're not going to just allow anyone and everyone to turn up and launch up. So you'll, there's a restriction there that you'll need to be on good terms with the Americans to be able to use this capability. Um, and then there's obviously the, the, the simple fact of technology. I mean, just because we can launch doesn't mean we have anything to launch. So there's still te technological hurdles that'll need to be overcome. And nothing is going to be easy. Each step, every all these hotels, all these big ideas that we had, they, they are still as hard as, as they ever were. It's just, it's just now possible to attempt to fix those problems. Which also brings into opportunities. There are going to be substantial opportunities within this space to be used. So I said a million times per year, possibly several. There's opportunities there. But with that comes trade-offs. So the engine exhaust, we're talking about how the rockets are launched. It's uh, liquid. It's called methalox. Um, compared to solid boost, which is actually really nasty stuff. 
It's actually one of the more environmentally friendly um, rocket fuels. It's a mix of liquid oxygen and liquid methane. Um, this is what Starship uses. This is also what the New Glenn uses, just as a point of interest. Um, the outputs of this though is CO2, so carbon dioxide, water vapour and nitric oxide. Um, the quantities there is the estimates of one launch. So around 2,700 tonnes of carbon dioxide per launch, just over 2,000 tonnes of water vapour per launch, and 1.7 tonnes of nitric oxide per launch. That nitric oxide is a bit more nastier than the other two, but when you multiply this several times per day over multiple rockets, you start to see this is, a, this is an impact. Um, your noise. I mean, exclusion zone, about 32 kilometres is needed for this to launch, and it's not going to be one or two rockets here or there as in the past, it's continuous. Like living next to an international airport here, it's going to, these are permanent exclusions. And hence why they have their desire to have their launch launches offshore. But noise, that sort of light pollution is an impact. We talk on orbital light pollution. This is one that's already come up. When you have potentially thousands, tens of thousands of satellites moving around in the sky, your ability to actually see the stars is diminished. There's always already complaints of the amount of clutter up there. And as a, maybe a doom, doomsday scenario, um, thought, but you may want to go out, go camping and look at the sky. Because this might be the last time humans can see a static sky. When you have tens of thousands of satellites potentially moving across the sky, the idea that we have of the sky as being stars and the occasional satellite, this may be the last point where that actually occurs. From here on out, there may be a moving sky with stars in the back, potentially. Doesn't that bring up the whole space junk issue? I mean, he's got 40,000 bits of metal floating around up there and he's going to make it difficult for his own rockets to go through. And all that stuff becomes obsolete after a while, so, yes. you know, it's flying for a hail of bullets, really. Uh, yes, um, with those ones though, the, the, the positive of being a low Earth orbit, because they're quite close down, is they, in fact they deteriorate and go back through the atmosphere quite uh, quickly. So a lot of these satellites further up, they just stay there for potentially years, decades, centuries or even permanently. But the smaller ones, Starlink, because they're so low down, they actually decay and burn up. So they burn up quite quickly, but while they're up there, there's still a hazard. And definitely a hazard. But again, if you spread 40,000 satellites across Earth's they don't, they're not, it, it, Earth's big, so you're not going to bump into them that often. But yes, it's still a problem. So is it just big enough so you can just fly up, like, you know, if you're making a flight, and just statistically you're going to go through, or do they track the path? They, they track them all. Everything is tracked. Yeah. They, have, they, they know where everything is, so they know where to launch. But yeah. again, these are the hazards that are going to be more of a presence going forward. Um, but in terms of trade-offs, nuclear waste disposal. I mean, one of the biggest issues with nuclear waste, nuclear power, is that we have nowhere to put the waste. Uh, when you have safe, reliable means of throwing stuff into orbit, potentially we have the, op the option, the solution there. Your nuclear fuel, once it's used, can be thrown into space, hurled to the sun, or even used in sort of long duration satellites and probes out into the solar system. So this, might, this may make nuclear power more viable than the way that was it previously. Question mark. Um, I'll leave it here, it's probably not going to be as much of an impact, but resource extraction. I mean, that's one that often gets talked about, sort of mining minerals on asteroids and all that. It's probably not going to have as much of an impact short term. But again, if SpaceX's goal is to get people to Mars, resource extraction and all the technologies and capabilities that go with it is likely to become more of a focus. Once SpaceX has solved the ability to go to space, their next problem to solve is getting to Mars and what you do that. Um, and that, that orbit of Mars. So that's where SpaceX is likely to put a lot of their focus once this current problem is solved. I'll move on to the next problem, which is that. In terms of the impacts, military capabilities. There will be a lot more stuff up there, which means there's a lot more stuff up there to protect. So the need to protect it, the need to keep it secure, supply and demand is also relevant to military capabilities. The desire to protect things will meaning that you need to have security forces, your space forces that are beginning to emerge, that will become more and more relevant as the amount of stuff up there becomes 
more important. But it also means the capabilities of what up there, what is up there becomes more powerful. So your reconnaissance, your surveillance, all those sort of things, you can do that at a much grander scale. Um, as a point of interest, the image there is firm's data. If you've never heard of that before, it is a NASA um, series of satellites that detects heat signatures. It's designed to pick up bushfires. So when there's bushfires, they use these to sort of find out where the fires are, out in the middle of the nowhere, so you can send your firefighters out to extinguish them. But it picks up all heat. And what that is, that is the front line in Ukraine. All those red dots are heat, heat signatures of the front line as the artillery exchanges, the battles are taking place, and using this heat signature, you can actually see where all the combat is going on there. So, nothing on planet Earth that is visible to space will be un unobserved. But it also means your ability to actually interact. When in the, so, several of the major powers have the ability to shoot down satellites, but when you potentially have thousands of satellites, that no longer exists. For example, Starlink has been used in Ukraine. They have not been able to jam that in the way they've been able to jam other capabilities. So space becomes bigger and more resilient. And we sort of touch on strike. I mean, if your your hypersonic technology, ballistic missile technology, the ability to actually use space for these sort of technologies becomes much more viable. But something to think about. But for every action, there's a counteraction in the military space. So some of the impacts we should be looking at here, the ability to hide on planet Earth becomes not important. So public deception becomes far more of a relevant thing. We saw again in Ukraine, for anyone, anything that moves on the planet Earth can never be seen. The need for public deception becomes much more relevant. You need to be able to say what is happening is not actually what is happening. Rapid escalation. The fact that everything is observed means that if you want to do anything on planet Earth, and get the element of surprise, you need to move fast with very short notice. Your hidden motives. When everyone is moving in plain sight, your need to have hidden, keep your motives hidden will become much more relevant. So the actions and words, what we say we're doing versus what we are actually doing, we'll be able to see when everything is happening. So you, when politicians or generals or whoever are actually talking, our ability to observe first what they say is going to become much harder to um, separate. And just as an interest, I've included MAD+. Plus. What is MAD? Mutually assured destruction. Obviously this is the idea during the Cold War that both sides had enough nuclear weapons that neither side could actually win, so we don't have a nuclear um, war. That image on the right, that there is a rocket with the warheads from a nuclear weapon. So each of those black um, cylinders is a nuclear warhead on the standard rockets. When you have rockets of a much greater scale, you can see you can fit a lot more of those in than has currently been the um, case. This makes potentially the world much more dangerous, but much more secure. In the past, the difference between a commercial launch and a nuclear strike was one rocket sending one satellite versus hundreds or thousands of rockets launching nuclear weapons. So for your a country that's on edge, your ability to di differentiate those two was quite easy. Potentially now, one rocket is all you need for a first strike. The difference between one rocket having a commercial launch and one rocket making an actual strike looks the same on a radar. So you'll need to be have your finger on the trigger, the red button ready to go, maybe a lot more dangerous. But this all, the other side is also the case. You only need one of these sort of rockets to remain and you have the ability to retaliate. So, mad sleuths, hence mad plus. So geopolitical. First move advantage goes to SpaceX. First move advantage goes to the Americans. They, they are ahead of the game. It really is only SpaceX doing reusability on any sort of scale. They will have the advantage in the short to medium term. But following is faster. It took, their, it took all of human history to get the Wright brothers and our ability to fly. Today, any classroom of primary school children can create a flying device and fly around. Once that technology is known, once we know how to do it, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can follow in the footsteps. So the second, the third, the fourth, the other capabilities that match what Starship and SpaceX are doing, 
a lot can come much faster than what it took to get the first ones, the SpaceX. So the Americans will have advantage initially, but everyone else can see what this can do. They can see the graphs, they know the capabilities, they'll be following as fast as they can. And a, bit, a big thing built in that will be national prestige. I mean, in the past, your European powers, the colonization, you wanted to be a big power, you had a colony. You had your ships going around the world doing this. Now that space becomes more natural viable, most likely you'll see the same sort of thing. National prestige will dictate that everyone, large power, but also much smaller nations, will have a presence in space. Doing stuff, which also means the space becomes much more crowded. So now into the last two, which is the cultural impacts. The importance of space is going to increase. When you have that sort of scale, this new reality dawning, just the importance of what we can do up there will become much more of a public um, known thing. Um, the boom and bust, the over and underestimation. There'll be a lot of pie in the sky belief that we are now going off to the stars, that we'll have star destroyers, that um, all those sort of ideas will come to fruition. Your colonies here, all those sort of big ideas. But a lot of those won't come to fruition. It's still incredibly difficult, incredibly complex, incredibly hard to actually do anything up there. So a lot of these ideas won't come to pass. But there'll also be a lot of underestimation. The complexities of what we need to do up there, a lot of it has been solved. And so a lot of things that we think are complex probably won't be. Um, there'll be a lot of hunt for opportunities. The opportunities here are going to be really quite substantial for those who can make use of them. But at the same time, the, the, the concerns are the impact, the environmental impact, the amount of CO2, the noise pollution, the light pollution, these are coming much more substantial because there's just much more of it. And again, regulation doesn't exist for most of this because it's a problem we've never had. But it's a problem we're going to be looking at. Failures are going to happen. Human beings will be lost in much larger numbers, most likely, Murphy's Law says, than in the past. There will be disasters, there will be explosions, but like all new technology, there's going to be setbacks and they'll be very public. But ultimately, it's going to be the new normal. There'll be that trend, like with, like with that new technology, there's that period where it's the new cool thing, everyone's so excited, and then it comes, settles down to be the new normal, like your iPhones. Large scale space eventually will be new normal. So the ripples are going to sort of dissipate from this technology. It's where they are, what they are, that's the question mark, and it's the need for this talk. Some of these impacts will come to fruition, some won't. But there really is going to be a before and after. So, uh, compared to the internet, there's those of us who remember what the, internet, what the communication was, what the world was like before the internet, and then there's the after the internet. We always could communicate, but the internet made, made the world so much closer, so much smaller, and the ability to communicate on a much grander scale than anyone could really conceive of before that period. It, but also those who are growing up with the internet have no concept of what the world was like before the internet. The internet has always existed. That sort of difference is likely what we're gonna see with space. We've always, we've had rockets, we've had satellites, but just nothing on this sort of scale. Which means there'll be a reawakening of that humans in space dream. A lot of the, a lot of the early, desire to do things in space meant that we're often shot down because we had that bottleneck. But now we won't have that bottleneck. So you'll see a reawakening of that human space drive. Bigger, as I mentioned, will become normal. Stuff up there will become normal. But the big one is you'll have much larger louder debates that are beginning already, but will become much grander. It's the positives versus the negatives. What your public versus private. How much of it is government research versus your tourists in space having a good time. The professionals versus tourists. There's, space has always been a world of professionals, of astronauts, of trained, of those who are trained by either the military or NASA or all the other countries. Now anyone with a few grand can basically go into space with a bit of training, same as you would on a 747. And really it's a one of exploration versus exploitation. We've always, space has really been an exploration space. It's satellites to here, it's probes to there, it's that big idea of let's explore the universe, let's explore the solar system. We'll now move more into exploitation. Can we mine? Can we live? Can we take something from it? That's the thing, that's the question that'll be the impact that'll really change. 
So what now? Well, where? Well, at the moment, those Starships, the boosters and all that, they're in training and they're testing. They're likely to have the actual launch in the next few months. The factory is in construction, so give it one to two years. So there's still a little time away, but it's... The reason for this talk is that it is quite close to when these things begin to happen. And hopefully from here, you're going to see when these events take place on the news, you can start to think of these other impacts that what you'll see and what might come from it, you'll be able to link. But nothing is certain. Space is hard, it's complex, it's costly. How much of this will actually come to fruition? Only time will tell. But, but scale is coming. Again, okay, I'll return to this image of the Semperia. Your, four, your three ship mast at the height of your sail of wood, and then the super tanks of the day. That's the scale difference. And I'll leave it with that graph as the end of the talk. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much. I sometimes feel like there's been the dream of space since the 70s through the 80s. It sometimes feels like it's the dream that drives it rather than much of a practical need. Can you address that? Like, Apart from tourism, you know, I um, can't hear like yeah. anything of why people really have a great, especially with robotics improving, why people who need so much stuff to stay alive need to be in space soon. Essentially because you can. I mean, the first people who sailed off across the Atlantic didn't need to. They had trade routes, they knew how to go. You didn't have to go off into the blue yonder. So there's that desire that you human desire to explore. And well, we still take holidays. Why do we take holidays? I and mean, that's why I sort of touch on tourism. And everyone has, every human has that ability to desire to explore something. So our desire to go and do it is really good. So that's where that's the supply and demand. Like going back to the innate human desire to do things, when we can, it's likely to happen, which is why I sort of focus more on the tourism side because that's where the great mass on scale, I think will change. But that's why I meant the, that the dream of space is that yes, like. The 60s, 70s, 80s, the early idea was space, colonies, all those big ideas. And it sort of hit that bottleneck that we just couldn't get up there and do anything. So, I mean, for the last few decades, that idea of doing big space really has died. And it's sort of seen as a quaint thing that they thought back then, but they just got wrong. Like flying cars. Everyone thought there was a thought that flying cars would be a thing. It just hasn't happened. This is the ability for remove that bottleneck. So we had an, had an idea, had a dream. It, didn't go anywhere, but now the bottom has been removed, and it's sort of hence the quip why I had this quip. This 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 talk is we remove that bottleneck, what changes? Do we go back to those ideas, go, okay, let's do that, or does something else change? Or is there a new bottleneck? Uh, just just a comment. I mean I was thinking an analogy might be the number of people climbing Mount Everest. It's really hard, it's littered with bodies, yet they still go up. Yeah. So and Mount Everest now is a traffic jam we can vent because it's not a one or two, it's everyone with a tour guide can make it up. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can. <laughs> um, you mentioned that there are a few different um, types of satellite constellations, like there's the Amazon one and I think the Chinese one. Are these all just different um, like improvements for the internet or? What's the point of having multiple different... Internet, uh, just commercial. Uh, for, for Amazon, it's it's because it's commercial. It's Jeff Bezos is competing with Elon Musk to have make money. So they're rivals, they want to make money. This is, it is just internet. It's, that, that's with the, sorry, with the, with those seller constellations, that their, their advantage is they are much closer to it. So that's why the internet has not really taken off as a satellite thing, because the satellites are so far out that you have a lot of lag and they, each satellite needs to do too much. There's never been, you, you do have internet by satellites, but usually sort of government or emergency services or it's been really expensive. With Star, the difference is they're much closer to Earth, much cheaper, they can mass produce them, and you don't have a lag, and so you think you can use them, it's much cheaper, it's, it's much better service. But the downside is you need lots of them because being close to Earth means they can see less of the Earth. So to get coverage, you need to scatter large, large numbers of them. Starlink is, again, it's like with the ability to catch rockets with a, 
basic pair of chopsticks. It's one of those ideas that was always an idea, it was a dumb, silly idea because you'd need too many of them, and now space is doing it. Doing it. And now everyone else is going, oh, maybe that is actually viable. They may attempt. I mean, the current legislation, like the, the international agreements, is that space stops at a certain level. Beyond that, it's open cyber. Like sort of like you know, international waters. Um, you had your airspace that is national, and beyond, I think it's like I think it's hundred kilometers. It's open space, like international waters. So beyond that, it's open cyber. But that is the. It is one of those potential impacts. So at the moment, it's just SpaceX doing this. But anyone else with technology and the ability to manufacture on a large scale can also replicate what the SpaceX is doing. So Japan, China, South Korea, Europe, anyone with a viable, essentially car manufacturing industry can also make a rocket at the same sort of scale. So it won't just be a million tons of torque from SpaceX, but a million from everyone, anyone else who can also make a factory. And that would be easy, most likely. And yes, the amount of stuff out there, and then who goes into what, is an unresolved issue. It's sort of, if everyone can turn up to the moon, who gets what terrain? You stake out a piece of dirt from there and go to some mine. We don't. And some will be f discovered by doing it. Uh, to be resolved. Okay. One more question. With so much uh, space debris which is going to be there in the space, will it uh, impact the future launches of the space debris smashing into the satellite which gets launched? Um, yes. Sure. But, um, the amount, of, the number of, the actual like the low Earth order satellites isn't as much of an issue because they, they're, 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 their orbit is known, they decay right, quite rapidly and burn up in the atmosphere, so they're not stuck up there for decades or centuries. Um, but there are a lot of them. I mean, but the other side, uh, Earth is big. Um, you think how many cars are there in a city like Brisbane? There's hundreds of thousands of cars. If you only got a few tens of thousands of satellites across all of Earth's um, orbit, they're there, but they're not as much of an impact as they are. You'll often see images of Earth covered in all the space debris. When you do it to scale, it's, as, it's not as much of a problem. However, the big issue is if things start colliding and then scatter up little pieces everywhere. That's when you really have a problem. So it's not a problem if no one hits anything, but once they do start colliding, that snowball effect, especially when there's thousands of satellites out there, could have a cascade effect that we haven't had in the past. So we'll, we'll find out the hard way. Any other questions, please? No, I was just thinking that there must be some potential maybe for um, to develop this kind of technology to do something with the amount of waste we have on the planet, for example, in terms of getting it shot into the sun, where that hasn't been viable in the past because of the expense. It could do things like potentially reducing that and giving us a, a, an avenue. To, to get rid of space. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's why I, I put up the, the nuclear waste disposal. That's obviously yeah. the big, <laughs> it's the probably the obvious one. That the nuclear waste has always been the big stick, one of, not the only, one of the big sticking points of nuclear power. It's, it's a great fuel source that's has very little impact on the environment compared to the other sources, but you're then left with the fuel. If you can throw that, throw that into space, set it into the sun, or you can use the low level energy left to power satellites that go off around Saturn or somewhere, then it becomes much more viable. I'm just thinking actually of general waste because but there's this sort of sense that in order for the for the, the populations that we have now, I mean if we think back say a hundred years, we had way more masses of people on the planet that were could barely survive. And in a way, it's mass production which has given work, which has developed things, which has meant that, that masses and masses more people have been able to raise out of that level of, of poverty um, but of course it's produced vast amounts of waste and then if we have a sort of movement of people going we need to use less use less the difficulty is if we use less the people who manufacture less then don't have jobs and then they also have a problem so one of I mean if we can get rid of waste then it means that that this the sort of model that we have of manufacturing to give work across the board to the world can then potentially 
still keep working for a while longer. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it's, you know, there's, there's those trade-offs. It's how much, the ability to get rid of space will definitely be one of the ones. Again, it's one of those potential industries that may emerge. But then again, there's always been a trade-off is how much waste you get rid of compared to how much sort of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide and cleans the atmosphere. Yeah. But I mean, you saw the size of the some of the topics. It may well be something more toxic stuff that may be a better way of getting rid of stuff. So, but that is again those potential industries that may emerge when you've got a hundred million, if you've got a million tons and no one's really using for much, maybe we can make if it's cheap enough, it's some will make use of that capability. I mean, it looks like we're burning millions of tons of fuel to launch, mm. you know, a million tons of yeah. stuff. Like, it just seems extremely efficient to get rid of waste in that way. Mm. But yeah, and it's, 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 that's that's one year's production. Multiply that. Yeah. But that's that's really the question of markets. Again, space X's drive is obviously Mars. They've got their thing, but that capacity keeps expanding every year. What will it be used for? And what are the impacts? Is there any sense of when um, when they'd like to get to Mars? As I mean, as soon as possible. <laughs> it basically, it, um, again, this is all driven by Elon Musk's desire to do that. I mean, that's why he started SpaceX, and he is again, it's he is um, very driven. If that's why he is the richest person on the planet, because he is incredibly driven. Um, that's his goal. He says, no, it won't be in his lifetime. He sort of understands that he is sitting on the foundations and then it'll actually happen after him. So he's not expecting it today, tomorrow, sort of this decade. It's solving one problem. Their, their whole um, approach is really just solving one problem at a time. So they could, that's why they had their Falcon 9. Because the first goal is, can you do a reusable rocket? Hence the Falcon 9, it was proven, it works. And that's why they haven't really used the um, Falcon Heavy because that wasn't the goal. It wasn't, the goal wasn't to make a reusable rocket for commercial things, is to make the Mars. So they stopped the development of Super Heavy, they don't really use it much, and now they're going to Starship because that's the full, cheap, reusable. And once they've solved that, then they'll move, then move to the next problem and the next and the next. So they take that engineering approach of just solve the problem in front of them. They have an idea of a broader scope, but they just solve what they've got and just move along like that, so. The idea of using starships to rapidly fly around the world, it's definitely come up. Um, so like your Concords, they'll just fly really high, go to uh, from, uh, London to Sydney in a couple of hours. And so it's one, it's a technology that will exist. Um, and it may well be viable, but it, yeah, it, that's one potential. So you've got the capacity, will you use it? Um, how, those sort of ideas have come up in the past and they've generally not been as viable just because of the cost and complexity. You're now having to land somewhere in, say, London with a rocket ship coming from orbit. But if they solve a lot of the problems, and as I mentioned, like, as if they make it safe, cheap, then most likely that will be one of the issues that may emerge. At least for all those who really need to get around the world. The way the Concorde was probably the best example. Uh, are there any health benefits to going to space? Um, no. You live a little bit longer. No. As, as an individual, no, your, your humans don't function well in space. Everything sort of starts going wrong. But in terms of research and development, yes, there's some benefits. Yeah. Um, but maybe there are some things that we haven't discovered. Like bragging rights. <laughs> I mean, that's, like one of the, uh, that's been one of the advantages of so the International Space Station being up there for so long, is that a lot of those problems they've now discovered and they've got either work around, solutions for all work around sports, so things like muscle loss and other sort of things. But I mean, there are definitely downsides. The, the, the entire human body is designed with gravity in mind. So your, your blood or your organs or your arteries, they're meant to pump with gravity. When there's something that's no gravity, everything sort of is out of whack. So I mean, it's definitely health. Um, but surely you could create your own gravity, you know. Um, and that's, again, there's, those are those dreams. I mean, yeah. the, um, to the, to the 2001 Space Odyssey, they had their rotating spaceships with gravity in space. They, that's the movie, but never, it was never viable because it was too costly to get up there. 
And that's in the Christian mind, it's now that there's no longer benefit on cost, that, 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 that bottleneck. Maybe we can do that. Maybe you can have your big spinny spaceships with gravity. But those, sol those solutions, those problems will need to be solved. They won't be easy, but it becomes viable to do it because this bottleneck has been removed. That's the question mark. Like, it is a serious question mark. I mean, when you can now send entire laboratories up, and almost any university can do that, what you can do in terms of research becomes much more viable. At the moment, everything had to go to the International Space Station and fit into a little cube and be one of many research things. So, science has always been small scale because you've only been limited with what that. But now, if a uni can, I mean, it's 20 grand per, for an average size human. If you want to send a car up there for a car size um, research package for maybe 100 grand, that becomes much easier to do. Well, much cheaper. Well, it's, it's the cost that any university can sort of do if it's worth it. So, cost. And that is where I, I wonder if the impact of the cost, especially for the environment here, would really be worth it to be doing all these tests. Yeah, and that's the question is that every rocket will have that cost regardless of what's going up, whether it's scientific research or it's a bunch of ter terrorists having a good time, that rocket still launches, it still has the same effect. And at the moment, there is, there is no legislation, there's no regulation, there's no restrictions on what you can and can't do, as long as you can, other than sort of mil militarizing space and some <coughs> more um, security related regulations, there really is space can be done with it. So it's a question to be asked, and then what do we do there? Is, is there regulation? Will everyone regulate? Will they agree to regulate? So Tesla now has factories outside of the US. Are there any restrictions on the SpaceX doing something? Uh, yes. Um, America has a lot of restrictions on rocket technology just because of the Cold War and obviously the military implications of that. So there's a lot more restrictions on what they can and can't do with rocket technology in the way there wasn't with um, Tesla. So there's I, I, ITSR, the International Agreement for Rocket Transfer of Technology, because obviously, as we so mentioned, military side, any rocket that can be used for mil um, civilian purposes can also launch things that are military related. So they, there's regulation to prevent that both within America and as global agreements. Which is where the the Australia question mark in terms of infrastructure comes in. We have agreements with America, like AUKUS, and just the fact we are close allies that we may be able to take advantage of the relationship in a way that other countries don't. But whether they were willing to set up something down here, who knows? It may be anything, any sort of built um, infrastructure in Australia takes a long time and may not be fast enough for what space wants. But it's those advantages and those opportunities that really the seeds will want. If we don't, someone else will. Yeah, that's the thing. Like the, it's the that first move advantage versus the following. It's, it's this is now. It's a first move advantage is Americans, but this technology and what you can do with it is now known and that it can probably work. So even if Americans and SpaceX don't go forward with it, everyone now knows you can do that. For their own, whatever ends they want. Is there anybody investigating other ways to get to space, like the space elevator? Or um, yes. Uh, I mean, it's... All that, so all that research has been done, all that research is still being done. Anyone who can get into space and not need a giant rocket, yeah. will obviously love to do it. Because anyone can see the impacts and restrictions on that. So, I mean, that's why the space planes exist. I mean, the Richard Branson's plane, the idea is that you'll fly up high enough and then you'll walk it off into space. Basically, you'll be a rocket still, but you'll launch from higher up. Um, those things are still being researched, but whether or not they'll come to fruition, and that's one thing that that ability to do that sort of research may be more viable. I mean, in the past, it's all been more theoretical. You can't just go off to space and test out a cable or this or that. But now, if you just want to test out a prototype to see if it can work, now it's much more viable. But yeah, if there was an easy way to get to space, 
We'll be doing it or yes, we'll keep you safe. Is the company called the Spurs Watch trying to embrace that life with the state? That's actually cool, yeah. They're, they're uh, trying to use momentum yeah. as a giant spinning wheel yeah. and you release it, it throwing it into space with anything you want. Yeah. Um, the G-forces <laughs> on your payload would be astronomical because yeah. you're basically eating, throwing a payload from ground to Earth in orbit. Um, maybe it'll work. Yeah. You won't watch a human being on that flight. <laughs> <laughs>